Hey there folks, my name is Dan Goodman and I want to welcome you to another exciting edition or rendition of whatever you want to call it for our Stormwind Studios succinct held online remote training sessions or shorts as we like to call them. This is technically the 13th short in the Wireless LAN Essentials series of shorts and we're going to focus on radio frequency fundamentals which will get abbreviated as RF so you'll see that acronym quite a few times here in this particular short. As far as the main topics we'll talk about the RF spectrum, the RF characteristics, the wave propagation effects, line of sight and I know it looks like Fresnel but it's the Fresnel zone and finally, the received signal strength indicator and signal to noise ratio. These are all considered to be the basics of radio frequencies, and then we're gonna tie them into the Cisco equipment that we have at our disposal. So probably the first thing to take away from all this is that the radio frequencies we use for wireless networks are part of a much larger radio frequency spectrum. It's not just uh, we have a monopoly on this particular uh, frequency range or whatever it may be. It exists within a much larger ecosystem, for lack of a better term. Now, RF signals are going to be used by wireless networks and a wide range of other communications. The lowest waves are going to be found in the sonic category. The highest are going to be in the gamma ray group, which is exactly how Bruce Banner became the Incredible Hulk. The wireless network range is right in the middle near the microwave segment. The radio transmissions themselves are going to consist of a transmitter and a receiver. Wireless stations technically have both, which make them transceivers. So if you hear that term, you want to think about wireless equipment. Now, as far as the RF characteristics for the frequencies that we use specifically for wireless local area networks, RF radio frequencies in general, it's easier for me to just say that, but just know that the, well, that's what the acronym is. Uh, radio frequencies begin with a high frequency of alternating current over a copper cable that's attached to an antenna. That antenna ultimately transforms the signal into a radio wave. So this will produce what's also known as a sin wave. This is essentially an electric current that varies uniformly in voltage over a specific period of time. That being said, there are several characteristics that describe a radio frequency signal. First and foremost is that term that's right in the name, frequency. Frequency is how often something occurs. Well, in this case, it's how often the radio wave occurs. It's how often the signal is seen by the transmitting and the receiving equipment. The standard measurement for frequency is the Hertz, H-E-R-T-Z, which gets abbreviated as a lowercase h. Lower frequencies are going to travel further in the air than the higher frequencies, but the higher frequencies tend to be more powerful. The analogy that I always like to think of is running versus walking. Running is a lot faster, it's a lot more powerful. However, I'm willing to bet that most of us could walk for several miles where we may only be able to run for one or two without keeling over, and I fall into that category nowadays, but that's the general idea. Lower frequencies travel further, higher frequencies are more powerful, and don't travel as far. Wavelength is the signal from the transmitter sent to the antenna. This is going to be the distance from one point of the cycle to the next point of the cycle. So you definitely want to refer to these diagrams here that we've got for each one of these characteristics. The shorter the wavelength, the higher the frequency. Now wireless networks are going to use waves that if you look at them on the proper equipment, they're going to basically be a few centimeters long. Other types of technologies use ones that are longer and shorter depending upon what it is they're transmitting and how often they're transmitting it. Amplitude is going to be the vertical distance between the crests of the wave. Basically, how much energy is injected into that signal. Now, different amplitudes can exist for the same wavelength or the same frequency. Basically, the more energy that goes into the signal, the higher the amplitude is going to be. The final characteristic that we need to be aware of is phase. Phase is the relationship between two or more signals that share the same frequency. Basically between the position of the amplitude crest and the troughs of two different waveforms. Now the phase can be measured using distance, time, or degrees. 
Now, if the peaks of two signals, if you're looking at this here, if, if when it's up, it's up, and when it's down, it's down on two different signals, when the peaks of two signals with the same frequency are in exact alignment at the exact same time, that is considered to be in phase. If the peaks of the two signals with the same frequency are not in exact alignment at the same time, they are considered to be out of phase. Now a signal will use these phase shift, either being in phase or out of phase or slightly in phase or slightly out of phase to convey information like the binary bits. Now, once this signal leaves the transmitting piece of equipment, there are all sorts of things that can happen to it. The analogy that I like to think of is kind of like how a pitcher throws a baseball. They're going to rock back and shift their momentum. They're going to find a balance point. They're going to make a stride. They're going to get their release point. They're going to get their arm angle. They're going to do all of these things that they can control but once they let go of the baseball, anything can happen. The wind could start blowing, it can start raining. Uh, in the case of Randy Johnson, a bird might fly right through the middle and explode. And of course, the batter can ultimately make contact with the baseball. If you think about that, that's kind of how radio frequencies work. From the access point, we can do all sorts of things by taking a look at the amplitude and the phase and the wavelength and the frequency. But once that signal leaves, it's going to be impacted by the environment it finds itself being transmitted in. So that means the chipset, the antenna, and all of the other components work together to produce a signal that will satisfy the needs of the environment. Unfortunately, just like the baseball, things happen once that signal gets released. The first one is known as free path loss. This is basically the attenuation of signal strength on its way between a sender and a receiver. Now free refers to the fact that there's not an obstacle causing this loss. It just happens by the natural tendencies of the signal. Loss is somewhat misleading because technically the signal doesn't weaken, it's just not received, which I know is kind of a minute point, but the signal is still out there, we're just not capable of hearing it on the receiving end. Now this is going to happen because the sender is one point and injects the energy into the signal. That energy never changes, however the distribution area determines when and where that energy ultimately goes. Now the receiver is more than one point and not all of the energy is received no matter what they do. This is typically caused by the fact that we have different antenna sizes on access points than we do on client devices. And if you think about it, a weaker signal usually doesn't satisfy the data requirements. So rather than try to process something that is pretty much useless, most client devices, most wireless equipment will just discard that signal because it's not carrying a ton of information. The next effect we can experience is what's known as absorption. And it's exactly what it sounds like. Energy gets absorbed from the wave, which means amplitude is impacted. The signal ultimately ends up less powerful, but we have the same frequency and wavelength that we originally did. However, there are different obstacles that will absorb different amounts of the energy. Some may only absorb one to 5%, some may absorb 100% of that signal. Now, different obstacles contain those different absorption levels. So you wanna think of an obstacle as walls, people, weather conditions, uh, the difference between drywall and wood and concrete because they're all going to absorb some, if not all of that energy. Reflection is another characteristic. In addition to absorption, a signal can be reflected by a variety of obstacles. Uh, porous material, materials, things like wood and drywall, tend to cause more absorption. Rough materials like brick cause a blend of absorption as well as reflection. Now, I don't mean to use the term rough as it relates to the material. Obviously, brick is very rough, but that's not what we mean by the term. We refer it to its kind of relationship to the wavelength, which I know is once again another minute point, but it is a point to make regardless. Flat materials 
or non-porous materials like glass and metal reflect the signal at an angle equal to the one at which it was received. Now frequency and angle will also factor into reflection. One frequency may have no reflection while another will have a very high level of reflection. If we had a signal that hits a window at an acute angle, that will have a different reflection than hitting the exact same window at an obtuse angle. And if you don't remember those terms, go back and review your high school <laughs> geometry book. Uh, scattering, pretty much exactly what it sounds like. As the signal travels in open space, things like dust, humidity, bubbles, yes, bubbles, density fluctuations, the cells and organisms, and the roughness of the reflection surface can cause scattering. In this case, the signal quality is impacted because of the negative impact on its strength. Now, this tends to impact shorter wavelengths more so than the longer ones, and it ultimately results in two effects. The degradation of the wave strength and probably more concerning is unpredictable effects themselves. If you think about a signal passing through a dense tree with a bunch of branches and twigs and leaves, the signal could bounce off a bunch of those tree leaves, then hit a window that is partially shaded, causing a little bit of reflection, and it kind of snowballs from there. Refraction sounds similar, but it's basically when the wave changes direction as it passes from one medium to another. And the best analogy I can kind of give you, if you take a look at the image there, imagine a straw or a spoon in a cup of water. When you look at it from the side, it almost looks like somebody cut the spoon wherever the water line is. That's the visual representation of refraction. As far as the effects on that signal or whatever it may be, this has minor impact on indoor networks. It's more of a concern for outdoor long range wireless links. Different densities and humidities across the globe will have different refraction effects. In a nutshell, drier air will uh, bend the signal away from planet Earth. Humid air will actually bend the signal back towards planet Earth. So we can use that to our advantage when it comes to wide range communications. Finally, we have diffraction. You want to think of this as a combination of reflection and refraction. This is where the signal bends around an object. There's no scattering, there's no absorption, but it does cause a longer and different path than originally intended. The most common effect we see from diffraction is a dead zone around the object causing the diffraction. Think about a giant boulder in the middle of a river and how the water will go around it, but right behind that boulder, that's a lot of time where the fish are hiding, so those are good spots for the fly fishermen out there in the world, but that same kind of concept applies here. So when you kind of bring all these into the fold, since any of or all of these effects can affect a single signal transmission, this tends to result in another signal effect known as multipath. Now, one of the things we need to factor in here is that most of the diagrams that we see for wireless network, what do they all have in common? Here's an access point, here's a couple of wavy lines going to the client, the client has their own wavy lines going back to the access point. We almost view it like an A to B sender to receiver line of communication. But a signal radiates out from the antenna, kind of like dropping a pebble in a still pond. It'll kind of have a ripple effect in that regard. This can lead to signal refracting, scattering, diffracting, reflecting, all before it hits its destination. Now, because the signal takes multiple paths to reach its destination, it's multipath. Multipath ultimately leads to two effects. One is signal distortion, two is signal weakening. When you're talking about signal distortion, just imagine that I clone myself three more times and we've got four different instructors talking about the same thing at the exact same point in time. 
you're not going to be able to understand it no matter how on sync we are. You'll hear a little bit of this one, a little bit of that one. So signal distortion is the first effect. Signal weakening is when the signal arrives out of phase resulting in down fade. Down fade is the term we use to describe a signal weakening. Out of phase is where the signal has a change of 180 degrees. Basically, when we're looking at it on the equipment, we've got the crests and the troughs. Basically, we receive the trough of the signal when we should have received the crest and vice versa. Now, when a signal is in phase, the signal change is less than 180 degrees, usually somewhere in the range of zero to 120 degrees. This actually results in up fade, which is the strengthening of the signal. So we can use that to our advantage in the right set of circumstances. Now I mentioned in an earlier short that multipath used to cause a ton of headaches in earlier wireless LANs. Nowadays, we actually use it to form the best possible version of the signal, kind of creating a Frankenstein monster of a signal, if you will, but a good Frankenstein monster, not a bad Frankenstein monster. The other characteristic we have to include in this particular discussion is line of sight and the Fresnel zone. Both of these items are of primary concern for outdoor long range wireless links. A signal typically is received in good condition if there is a clear line of sight between the sender and the receiver. Now I'm referring to a radio line of sight, not a visual line of sight. It's not that, oh, I can see the antenna, we have line of sight. That's good, but the radio is really what we're concerned about. Any obstacles can prevent communications from occurring. Beyond certain distances, we also have to factor in the curvature of the earth. One mitigation technique is to ensure a minimum distance between the direct line of sight and the closest obstacle. But we need to ask ourselves the question of what exactly is that minimum distance considered to be? We are essentially going to require two pieces of information to calculate that minimum distance. The distance between the two points and the frequency of the signal itself. Now, physicist Augustin Fresnel, which is where we get the name from, developed a method to calculate this Fresnel zone. This zone is essentially an imaginary ellipse that gets drawn between the transmitter and the receiver where any sort of distortion has the most negative impact on the signal. This will essentially calculate when the signal will be in phase and when it will be out of phase. That Fresnel zone should be at least 60% free from any obstacles. Now, theoretically, there's an infinite number of zones within this imaginary ellipse, but really the main concern is that first zone. Ideally, you want to exceed that 60% threshold by keeping 80% of the Fresnel zone completely clear of any obstacles whatsoever. Now, the next thing we're going to get into really quick is going to be the received signal strength indicator as well as the signal to noise ratio. When you factor in all of these RF factors, allow myself to introduce myself, we need measurements for both the signal strength and the signal strength relative to the noise around it. This is where RSSI and SNR come into play. RSSI measures how much of the transmitted signal was ultimately received. This is expressed in decibels relative to milliwatts, otherwise known as dBm. Now the key term to take away from that is a relative measurement as opposed to an exact measurement. A relative measurement is a really good estimated guess, which creates its own set of headaches, but we'll talk about that at a later date and time. This is ultimately gonna be calculated from the recipient's point of view since they typically don't know how much power was originally sent. They just know what was received. This is a grade value that ranges from zero, where we have no signal or no reference, all the way to a 255 maximum. The big problem with this range is that the grade is ultimately subject to a vendor's interpretation. 
and really what you see this is if you take a look at your wireless icon on your smartphone or your tablet sometimes you get three bars sometimes you get four bars that's not a standard measurement that's what AT&T or Verizon or whoever thinks that particular value is going to be so it's not an exact value in any shape or form now in a nutshell the receive signal strength indicator is how strong a receive signal is relative to itself in different locations now the SNR ultimately determines how much stronger the signal is relative to the surrounding noise now it's going to be built upon the RSSI essentially compares the RSSI to noise like DBM it's a relative measurement as opposed to an exact measurement really the big characteristic to take away from it the higher the SNR the better the signal quality is going to be now SNR is considered to be more universal than RSSI it's kind of a more non vendor specific type of measurement so hopefully this was a beneficial beneficial piece of information to you or beneficial depending upon how you want to look at it uh, thanks for taking the time to watch our short on another topic within wireless LAN essentials make sure you subscribe to our channel that you are so that you are notified of these shorts shortly after they become available see you guys soon